So the president was discharged today from Walter Reed and will continue to undergo treatment in Washington, D.C. Skylar Henry has the very latest. President Trump emerged from Walter Reed Army Medical Center wearing a surgical mask. He flashed a thumbs up sign, then walked to his motorcade without assistance. After a short flight aboard Marine One, the president climbed the South Lawn stairs, then removed his mask and recorded a video message. I learned so much about coronavirus. And one thing that's for certain, don't let it dominate you. Don't be afraid of it. You're going to beat it. We have the best medical equipment. We have the best medicines, all developed recently. The president's doctor says he will continue to undergo treatment at the White House. Though he may not entirely be out of the woods yet, the team and I agree that all our evaluations, and most importantly, his clinical status, support the president's safe return home. Dr. Connolly said the president would be closely monitored for the next week. If we can get through to Monday with him remaining the same or improving better yet, uh, then we will all take that final deep sigh of relief. In an NBC News town hall, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden said President Trump bears some blame for his condition. Anybody who contracts the virus by essentially saying masks don't matter, social distancing doesn't matter, I think is, is, is responsible for what happens to them. At least 19 people with ties to the White House have tested positive for the coronavirus, including two Republicans on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Next week, it's slated to take up the Supreme Court nomination for Amy Coney Barrett. This body will not cease to function just because Democrats are afraid they may lose a vote. On Monday, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell postponed Senate floor activity for the next two weeks, but said the Supreme Court hearing will go forward as planned. Skyler Henry, Capitol Hill. Tonight, President Trump is being criticized for downplaying the severity of COVID-19 upon his return to the White House. One local congressman called the president's message an example of, quote, reckless rhetoric. News 8's Steve Fiorina has more on that reaction and what a local doctor has to say about the president's condition. The entire world's been focused on the president being diagnosed with coronavirus, with his treatment, and now his self-assessment. As he returned to the White House after being released from Walter Reed National Military Medical Center for treatment of COVID-19, President Trump urged Americans, don't let it dominate you. Don't be afraid of it. He said he was feeling really good. We spoke to Encinitas Dr. Becca Rodriguez Regner. With President Trump going home, you know, it really just depends on the uh, stability of his condition. So we're really looking at his vital signs. What does his temperature look like? She said CDC guidelines include keeping that mask on when near anyone. The N95 mask should be worn uh, as he is transferring from the hospital back to the White House. And again, those around him wearing the same N95 uh, to protect each other. Uh, and, and make sure no, none of the virus has spread. Cameras were following as Mr. Trump climbed up to a balcony and stood for a moment. Some on social media pointing out that he appeared to have difficulty breathing. A bit more of his statement earlier. We're going back, we're going back to work, we're gonna be out front. As your leader, I had to do that. I knew there's danger to it, but I had to do it. Democratic Congressman Scott Peters of San Diego said he was heartened to hear that President Trump was improving but questioned his remarks to the nation, quote, to suggest that we shouldn't be afraid dishonors every single American who has lost someone to this pandemic. More than 210,000 lives have been tragically lost to COVID-19. The president received the highest quality care in the world and is feeling better. That does not mean we can disregard the gravity of this disease. I encourage San Diegans to trust the science that tells us to continue to be vigilant. The president's team of doctors said he's not out of the woods yet, but he's surrounded by world-class medical care 24-7. Steve Fiorina, News 8. Tonight, county health officials are reporting 224 new COVID cases. That's about 3% of the more than 6,500 tests taken. None of those new cases are tied to San Diego State University. However, seven previously reported confirmed cases are now associated with SDSU. No new deaths were reported today, which is typical for a Monday, and that total remains at 803. 
Our adjusted case rate is 6.7 and the positivity rate is 3.5 percent. Those numbers will be updated by the state at noon tomorrow. Governor Gavin Newsom has nominated the first openly gay black man to the California Supreme Court. If confirmed, Martin Jenkins will be only the third black person to serve on the state Supreme Court. He's nominated to replace Justice Ming Chin, who retired at the end of August. Jenkins is a former federal prosecutor. I can't tell you how important it is to have someone on the bench who's a living, breathing example of the idea that love means love. He hasn't just learned the power of the law to protect our human rights. Martin Jenkins has lived it. The governor also gave an update on wildfires ravaging the state. The August complex fire in Northern California has now burned more than one million acres. Well, temperatures out there were definitely still hot, and we've been talking about this over the past couple of days, and it's feeling like a broken record at this point, but we actually broke some records with our heat. I'm Chief Meteorologist Carlene Chavis taking a look at our highs earlier today. We hit 101 for uh, Escondido as well as 100, and that was for... Uh, El Cajon and 86 degrees for downtown. So talking about records, we actually broke the record in Escondido, tied the record, excuse me, in Escondido, but broke the record for Ramona. Also broke the record for Chula Vista at 90 degrees earlier today. So taking a look at where we're going with the heat, well, not very far. As we go into tomorrow, we're still going to hold on to some warmer temperatures, but keep in mind it won't be as hot as today. A trough of low pressure, a weak one, and that's going to bring us back into the uh, more seasonal range as we go into Thursday. But then temperatures look to dip down once we get past that point, and we are even looking at a chance for rain. Yes, I said the R word. We'll have all the details coming up in your complete forecast. Back to Marcella. We're less than 30 days until the election, and today marks the first day of early voting at the registrar's office here in San Diego. News 8's Brandon Lewis has more on that and what you need to know if you plan to cast your ballot before November 3rd. We saw quite a few people who came to cast their ballots on the first day of in-person voting, but this is by no means required. That's because this election, all Californians will receive a ballot in their mailbox starting today. It's the first day of in-person voting at the registrar, and it was so far so good. This is going to be an interesting election. There's uh, always something unique about every election I've ever conducted. For the first time, all nearly 2 million registered voters in San Diego County will get a ballot by mail. You can either mail it back or drop it at an official drop box. If you really want to vote in person, you can come to the registrar anytime before the election or between October 31st and November 2nd, at your designated polling site. Keep in mind, lines may get longer closer to Election Day. That's one of the reasons why we're asking for voters to act early through the 29-day period that we are open here at the Registrar Voters Office and also consider voting that mail ballot because it could create a long lines. The other incentive to vote early is your ballot is among the first to get counted and reported on election night. However, the registrar stresses all eligible votes will get counted. It just may take some time. On election night, the first results will come in shortly after the polls close. Then expect a slow drip of results until all precincts have reported. From there, we'll get daily updates through the 13th. After that, it's up to the registrar to report new tallies. The last day mail-in ballots can arrive is the 20th, if they were postmarked by Election Day. Finally, the registrar will certify the results on or before December 30th. And these attacks on the integrity of election uh, serve nothing other than to undermine confidence in the election which voters deserve to have. The good news is there are fewer questions on the ballot this year. There are just 37 compared to 52 during the last presidential election. There are new accusations claiming the San Diego Sheriff's deputy pulled a woman by her hair during a traffic stop. Woman filed a complaint at sheriff's headquarters today after joining civil rights leaders for a rally tonight. Amanda Shotsky is there with more on why they say this deputy is a threat to public safety. Shinita Phillips Abu filed that complaint right here just a few hours ago. She claims that it was Deputy David Lovejoy who became aggressive during a traffic stop last week. 
With tears in her eyes, Shainita Phillips Abu holds a bag of her own hair. Locks that she says were ripped out during an aggressive interaction with a San Diego Sheriff's deputy. He pulled me by my hair and yanked me out of my car by force. On Monday, Phillips Abu filed an official complaint at Sheriff's headquarters after sharing her story. It was like he wanted to see me suffer. It happened October 1st while she was driving home from the post office. Phillips Abu claims the deputy pulled her over on the 67 South for a malfunctioning brake light. But she says the interaction became heated after she started recording it on her cell phone. He started to yell, get off the phone, put the phone down now. And at that point, I became afraid. Pictures from that video show the deputy reaching inside the vehicle. Phillips Abu says the officer knocked the phone out of her hands, and when she refused to get out of the car, he dragged her out by her hair, handcuffed her, and then placed her in the back of a squad car. Where I was, uh, had my hands behind my back for about six hours straight. My body was so swollen and bruised. A statement from the San Diego Sheriff's Department reads, we are aware of the incident and have initiated an investigation into the matter. We do not want to come to any conclusions until we have all the facts. Every time a rogue officer shows themselves, we are going to show up for the victim. Supporters of Phillips Abu call this incident a clear abuse of force and racially motivated. They're asking that the deputy be held accountable. Please stop assaulting people. Stop abusing your power. The Sheriff's Department says Deputy Lovejoy was wearing a body camera during the stop. However, that footage won't be released as it's part of the ongoing investigation. Back to you. New tonight, we're learning more about the man killed by police officers following a 100 mile long chase this weekend. He's been identified as 31-year-old Christopher Ulmer of Whittier, California. Police say the chase started in Santa Ana early Sunday morning, and it continued down Interstate 5 to the 805 in Chula Vista. That's where Ulmer stopped the car, got out, and was shot by officers. His death was ruled a homicide. The shooting is now under investigation.